the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number 2, chapter number 2 of the book of Ecclesiastes. And let's pick up there in verse number 18. Ecclesiastes chapter number 2, again, verse number 18. You found that, Katie, yet? You found that yet? Taylor, you got that there for me yet? All right, thanks. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse number 18. And let's read together. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse number 18. I hated all my toil which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or he'll be a fool. Good morning, Brother Dylan. It's a joy to see you this morning. Yet he will be master of all which I toil and use my wisdom under the sun. This is also vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair. Over all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes a person who is toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is vexation. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This is also vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one, to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and striving after when. Father, as we open your word this morning, we, we come and we just ask that you would speak today words of life and truth. And Lord, as the word is open at Maranatha and Pittman Creek and Mount Zion and, and Lord over here at Cedar Grove and at First Baptist and Neely's Creek and Harmony Fellowship, and all these churches gathered around us on this south end of this county as the word of God is open. Lord, may you fill the pulpit with preachers that expound the word and teach the word to their people. That, Lord, our people will not be people with a lack of knowledge, but they know the word. And that, Lord, you would speak by the power of your spirit. And, Lord, I pray that you would take me, a broken sinner, desperately needing you in every area of my life, and God, use me today to speak truth. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to tell you, I think if there's anything is striving after the wind, anything that really is striving after the wind, it would have to be labor. It would have to be everyday work. And Solomon felt the same way. Now I want you to remember Solomon's on a journey here under life under the S-U-N, not the S-O-N. And Solomon has come along the way here and he has began to discover some things. He, he checked out wisdom and folly. And he said, well, first of all, first of all, he said wisdom and folly, that's all vain too. And then he checked out pleasure. I mean, he had the homes, he had the slaves, he had, he had the food, he had the wine, he had it all. And yet he said, at the end, that was foolish. And then he comes back to wisdom and he says, well, even earthly wisdom. In other words, uh, having a little head on your shoulders, and that may not be godly wisdom, but it's earthly wisdom. That's, that, there's some advantages in that. He discovers that. But no matter what he is, no matter what he finds to do, no matter what Solomon finds to do, his quest failed him, and he ended up, as we've already seen, he ended up really, what Solomon did, he ended up hating life, and he hated everything under the S-U-N. And one of the things he hated 
Well, we see it. Verse 18. I hated all my toil. One of the things he hated was work. He hated it. He hated work. And Solomon went out to work hard because, see, he thought that if he worked hard, then he found meaning in life. But after he worked all that he did, he began to discover that, well, this is vanity too. This don't make a lick of sense either. And many people, many people still expect uh, work to give them some purpose in life. Teenagers think, man, if they get a job, Chuck, they're on easy street now. Hey, 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 we've got a job. We've got uh, minimum wage or maybe a little better. And Man, we have it made. But they forget that when, uh, when a job comes along, 16's here, 17, 18, and guess what comes along with all of that? Responsibility. And there's gas to put in the car, and there's uh, food to eat, and uh, if you're going to take a girl out, or the guy's going to take the gal out, guess what? Mom and Dad don't fund that bill anymore. Who does? <laughs> they began to see the work. A lot of people think they can find a sense of satisfaction in work, a purpose of life, but according to... To the book of Ecclesiastes, work, listen, listen, work, listen, work is the wrong place to find satisfaction in life. Everything we get. And every Monday morning, sometimes we get this way, don't we? We get tired of doing the, what? Same old thing. Same old thing, over and over again. I had a funeral of a firefighter this week, and thank you for praying for me. I mean, I got to preach the gospel, man, to a bunch of people uh, Thursday night. But at least those guys talk. And I want to tell you, great, listen, there's some heroes there, there's Volunteer firefighters and EMS workers, man, they, they, they just, you just, if you saw them in person and you saw what they did, you'd think, man, them great folks. They're great folks. But I want to tell you, I listen to their stories, especially EMS stories. I listen to them because they're working a job. And it doesn't matter if they're here in Somerset, Kentucky, or in Los Angeles, California, working on an EMS bus. It's the what? It's the same thing over and over and over again. And it's with you too, right? Amen? Same stuff. Same hustling to find the next house to sell. Same buyer. Same, same car. Over and over and over again. And, we get, and sometimes we get tired of that, don't we? And then sometimes we get inconvenienced at work. What do you mean, how do we get inconvenienced at work? Here's how we get inconvenienced at work, Brother Donnie. I'm certain you've never run into this, not in your illustrious career with the county of, of, of Pulaski, that somebody, they just don't do their work. They just don't do their work, and you're the one having to go behind to keep everything up to where it ought to be. Can I get an amen, Donnie? That, that, that's the way it is. And so we begin to struggle with the vanity of work. And as for, as, as for Ecclesiastes is concerned, there's, true, there's two main problems with earthly work. First, the first problem is, at the end, someone else will profit from your work. Do you know that? At the end of the day, somebody else profits from your work. And Solomon, you see, 
That, that was one of Solomon's problems. See, Solomon was a big thinker. And he, and, he, and he always asked him the question, why? And Solomon wanted to know, at the end of the day, what kind of return does he get for work? Because remember, already in chapter 2 and verse 16, Solomon's already told us that he's thinking about what? Death, the great equalizer. He says, so okay, if I do all of this work and I do all these things, uh, what good? What's the bottom line for who? Me. Huh. And then Solomon realized that one day, He's going to leave it all behind. Look at verse 18. He says, I must leave it to a man who will come after me. <laughs> I'm going to leave it all. See, I want you to know, listen, you, you, you can take a whole lifetime. You really can. You can take a whole lifetime making a home, getting good retirement, but at the end of the day, every one of us here, and I'm not saying it's wrong to have a good home, and I'm not saying it's wrong to have retirement. All of that's smart. But at the end of the day, listen, at the end of the day, you can't take it with you. It's over. And maybe... Maybe our possessions will end up in somebody's hands who's wise and smart and used it for the glory of God, but maybe not. As I was studying this, my mind just ran to auctions. I'm an auctioneer. And I've done estate auctions. You know, grandma and grandpa or mom and dad's dead. And they left a brick home and 40 acres of land and a few tractors. We're going to sell it off. We will sell it at absolute high dollar auction. And when, when it's all over, maybe somebody wins the bid that's smart and going to continue to cultivate the land and take care of the home. And maybe... We have somebody that's just in, in just, just don't take care of it. Or lots it all off and cuts it up in one acre track. There's nothing wrong with that per se, but it was meant as a farm at one time. Am I making sense? You don't know whose hands it's going to go in. And that's what Solomon says. Look at verse 19. He says, And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool? Yet he will be a master for all which I told, and used my wisdom and under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over the toll of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This is a vanity and a great evil. One man works harder than all of his life. One man works hard all of his life and someone else gets to enjoy the wealth. Some says that don't make sense. When someone died, and, and, when, and, then, and then when Solomon did die, and by the way, you know that, Solomon did die, he left all of his wealth to his oldest son, King Rehoboam. And he was such a fool that he lost ten twelfths of his father's kingdom. You can see why Solomon's concerned, right? You see, here's the reality. The reality is that we will spend our whole lives working to gain something we can't keep. It's enough to what? Working nine to five, what a way to make a living, just get and buy, no taking and no giving, huh? It's enough to what? Drive you what? Crazy if you let it, nine to five. 
That's exactly what's going on. And listen, it is enough to drive you crazy. So I want to call your attention, first of all, to the curse of work. Now, you're going to have to hang here with me this morning because we're going to take a somersault. We're going to take a, we're literally going to flip 180 here in a minute. So, first of all, I want you to see the curse of work. Look at verse 22 and 23. He says, What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow. And his work is, vexa is vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This is also vanity. Solomon says, I want you to know what work is. Work is toil and trouble. Solomon calls it striving. Work makes, and, and it does. Are you, am I not right? Work can be a physical demand and mental demands, but it, all of it takes a toll on you. Solomon says it's sorrow and it's vexation. Think of all of the worry that work brings. Just think with me a minute. All that worry brings. Back when the economy got bad. <laughs> Tough. Uh, who's going to sell a home? And when you go out to talk to them and sell it, and they gave 150 for it, and now it's 100, worth 100 and a quarter, how are they going to sell it? I remember Dave coming in, praying, asking us to pray for him. Business wasn't coming through the door at four, right, Dave? Didn't know how he was going to make it. That's what it does. We worry. See, that's what we do. We worry, do we have enough work to feed our family and take care of ourselves? Or, or what's the opposite of that? Then we have what? Too much work. <laughs> we can't get it all done. At one moment we're worried about do we have enough, and the next time we turn around, oh, wait a minute, God's blessing me and I'm piled up. I don't know what I'm going to do. We get all stressed out. We get all tired, tore up. And I can't take care of this one. I can't take care of that one. I'm forgetting which this one is and that one is. And then Solomon says we even lie awake at night worrying about it. Anybody ever done that? How are we going to do that? So from the beginning of life to the end of life, there is labor. And if we try to, try, try to find significance in our work, it is vain. And listen, at the end of the day, if we try to find significance and happiness and comfort and peace in our work, we will be disappointed. If you make work your life, listen, you make work your life, you're going to leave empty. Look at verse 23. For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is vexation. All of his days are full of sorrow. And his work is vexation. That's the bad side of job. But now, look, now we're getting ready. I told you we was going to do a 180 here. I told you we're going to turn a reverse. We're going to go the opposite way. Point number two. Enjoy your work. Wait a minute, Brother Ron. He just said it's a vexation. We can't find enjoyment in it. Enjoy the job. Look at verse 24. There's nothing better for a person. Now look, Solomon just said it's awful. But then verse 24, there's nothing better for a person that he would eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the what? Hand of God. For apart from him who can eat or who can have enjoyment. There's the big turn. I mean, there's the, there, yeah, listen, listen. We don't have big enough U-turns on 27 to show you this U-turn. This is a huge U-turn. At the end of chapter 2, now listen, this might be a place to mark something. At the end of chapter 2, it explains everything preceding this, these verses and it explains everything following these verses. Because now what's Solomon starting to do? 
And we already saw a hint of it already. But now what is he starting to do? He is now starting to see what life is like when we live with God in our lives, live with Christ in our lives, as opposed to living without Him and doing our own thing. He's seeing that joy, that real joy, lasting joy, comes from the hand of God. And that God, listen, that God gives meaning to everything in life. Amen there. Dusty, she's smart as tech. She can tell me what this word, what, what this is from. I didn't get what it's from. Something about the East-West War or something. It, the book starts off this way. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. And Jeopardy for $200. You don't know. Big, thick, war and peace. What? Tol Tolson? Tolstoy. It starts out, the book starts out that way. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. Now listen to me. That is where we live. We live in a world that is cursed by sin. We know that. All we got to do is look around. And really, we don't really have to look around. We can also, we can look within. Amen? We know the world is cursed by sin, but it is also a world that God essentially created good. It's the best of times, and it's the worst of times. And here's what God did. God then came in the flesh... And took up on the sin of humanity and died and was buried and rose again the third day. And he's redeeming the world. Men and women and boys and girls and yes, the creation itself for his glory. It is the best of times and it is the worst of times. And because of that... We can experience joy. We experience joy as well as sorrow. Especially, especially if we know God in a personal saving way. We know Him as Savior and Lord of our lives. Now notice, notice, what, notice what Solomon says brings joy. Verse 24. There is nothing better for a person that he should eat, drink, and find enjoyment in his toil. This is also, I saw, is from the hand of God some of the things some of the things that he had rejected as failing to bring meaning to life now what does he do now he eats he drinks the finest wine he works hard and what does Solomon find in it now he finds enjoyment in his work what makes the difference What's the difference? What's the difference previous to now? Here's the difference. Because, listen, listen, listen. This is the only thing that makes a difference in anybody's life. King Jesus. That's what makes the difference. That's the end of the bottom line. You can add it up. You can, you can ask all the questions you want to ask. But at the end of the day, the answer is Jesus. That's why he finds now enjoyment. That's why he finds enjoyment in life now. You see, up to this point, God is hardly even mentioned in the book. Verse 25, Solomon says, For apart from him, who can eat? Or who can have enjoyment? Let me tell you something. You may be here today and you don't know Jesus. You love the light more than you love darkness. The wrath of God is upon you. Look, you're going to eat something today. <laughs> and that's the good hand of God letting you do that. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. 
No one can find joy any more truer than finding joy in Christ. And if you're having a problem finding joy in your life this morning, you're really having a problem. Listen, I want you to hear me. I want you to hear me well on this. If you're having a problem finding joy in your life, it could be because God is no longer the center of things. But me, myself, and I are. And Solomon has stopped trying to make pleasure for himself and has started doing what? He started doing what? He's try, he stopped trying to build pleasure for himself and he starts receiving it from the hand of a gracious God. And he says, boy, I enjoy, I enjoy this wine. I enjoy this pork we barbecued over the grill a while ago. I enjoy all of these houses I made. And I got to get up and go to work in the morning. Boy, I'm, I'm thankful I can. Because he's seeing it now, not as a toll, but as a gift from a holy God. That's what he's doing. That's what he's getting at. Go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4 real quick. Verse 4 and 5. First Timothy chapter 4. Verse 4 and 5. And listen to what he says. For everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is made, by, it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. Everything created by God is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it's received with what? Thanksgiving. Now that's not a license for you to go out and sin. That's not what Paul's saying. But this is, but, but he is saying it is a call to be thankful in the liberty that God gives you, the freedom that God gives you. Earthly pleasures are a gift from God. And the enjoyment they bring, now listen, the enjoyment they bring ought to encourage us to worship a holy God. I know some of y'all, you, you've got different hobbies, you've got different things. Look, I, and I can't even put it in words what I'm trying to say exactly. But there is something about the enjoyment of a good baseball game, a good high school baseball game or a basketball game or a volleyball game or even a tennis match. that makes me want to praise Jesus. I can't explain that. I don't understand that all exactly, but, but I, my mind starts thinking, look at that young man by, by, at that plate. And look at him swinging that bat. And all of the effort he's put in to be at that plate. Look at that catcher. Look at that pitcher. And when he throws that ball, it's floating way out over here and all of a sudden it gets to the, to the plate it's whoosh it's in and you hear that umpire go Hick one ah, that causes me to say hallelujah thank you Jesus for that enjoyment because I'm looking at the integral details of what all that happens and let me tell you something none of that could happen and the enjoyment of it couldn't happen without the hand of a holy sovereign God now, for the Thompson family and Bruce, it might be, uh, well, no, I better not. I'll get, I'll get y'all into a fight right there. I, I, I mean, I know it's Chevy and Ford or Ford and Chevy. I can't remember which one it is. But, but uh, looking at a big Ford truck and the time and the hours and, and, and spent to put in that and the detail, it ought to cause you, it's the enjoyment. It's enjoyment. Yes, it is. But it ought to cause you to what? Worship. Because we, we, we begin to learn to receive the good things in life as a gift rather than entitlements. Somehow or another in America, we think we ought to. We're mockings. We ought to get this. We ought to get that. No. We're not entitled 
We're not entitled. But God is gracious. And instead of being worried about entitlements, we experience genuine joy and thanksgiving because what does Paul write to the Corinthian church? Whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, you do it all to the what? The glory of God. So work is a gift we receive from the hand of God. Work is is one of the ordinances of creation. God told Adam and Eve, take care, work. It's part of God's good original plan, but because of sin, our work has been cursed, which turns labor into what? Toil. But the thing is, we're made in the image of a working God. You need to understand that. We're made in the image of a working God. And because we're made in the image of a working God, we can find pleasure in work. And the way we do that is, we work for the boss, the company, ourselves. No, we work for God. Work for the glory of God. See, it's easy to get caught up. Listen to me now. It's easy to get caught up in a career. Get your life all consumed by your career. It's easy to get caught up in about ambition and what, what you want or a work schedule or a paycheck. Sometimes folks sacrifice their families and their lives because they're going to give them a promotion and uh, it's going to take them away from home a little bit more, take them away from the church a little bit more, but they get a paycheck at the end. And sometimes we get carried away with all that without once stopping to ask, is our work, what we're doing, is it pleasing to God? Because He's our true boss. He is our master. He is our savior who gives, who forgives us of our sins. See, we're working under a God. See, listen, what we're doing is, look, look, here's what Solomon did, here's what we have to do. Solomon started saying, I'm working under the S-O-N, not the S-U-N. Got it? That's what Solomon says. Number three, look at the fruit of our labor. Look at verse 26. He says, For the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy, but to the sinner he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and striving after the wind. There's two distinctions right there. Those that live under the mercy of God and those who are unrepentant sinners who live under who do not live under the mercy of God notice how the people that please God are described he says they're given wisdom now you want to mark that too because that's the first time in this book that Solomon says this is God's wisdom now not the S-U-N wisdom not just the (coughs) common knowledge head out of the rear end and on your shoulder wisdom no No, this is God's wisdom. Give wisdom, which is the first time Solomon says it's a divine gift. Wisdom, and when wisdom comes, guess what else comes? Knowledge and joy. And the reason these people are pleasing to God, now why are these people pleasing to God? Because they have been blessed by God. Say amen. If we live for God's pleasure... We'll be richly rewarded with all of the spiritual blessings that God loves to give us. But there's another part. There's the unrepentant sinner. No reward, only loss. This is the first time that Solomon even talks about in the book about sin. And one of the largest, one of the biggest vanities under the sun, one of the biggest vanities under the sun is human depravity. We're depraved. And it is the sinner who sees work 
It's the unrepentant sinner who sees work as vanity. His life is dominated by what? What's he doing? Gathering and collecting. Gathering and collecting. Gathering and collecting. What's he doing? He's building up a good bank account, ain't he? He's got a great retirement system. He don't have to worry about Obamacare because he can pay for it himself. That's what he's doing. He's gathering, he's gathering, he's gathering. I've learned something since I've been in real estate. I'll just, here's how it is. I've been in part of a deal before where I didn't work for this guy. The other agent did. This guy, as the old saying goes, has enough money to burn a wet Georgia mule. Now, I don't know how that saying ever got started, but, uh, but, but he had enough money to burn a wet Georgia mule and not miss anything. Got this deal together. The other side gets commission and we get commission. He's fussing with his realtor over $1,000, $2,000. The other realtor just keeps cutting, just cuts their commission. Down, really, down to nothing, just about. Now look, this guy, look, this guy, he could write a check for $10,000 and not miss it. Just forgot where he put it. But he's arguing over $3,000. What is he? He's doing just like Sodom. Gathering and collecting. That's what he thinks he's doing. But at the end of the day, when death comes creeping in his room, it won't matter, will it? And that's what Solomon's getting at. Gathering. Sooner or later, <laughs> sooner or later, you know what that old boy's going to have to do? He's going to have to leave it all behind. Now, there's times in this life you and I are going to suffer as believers while sinners prosper. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. You know, we cannot understand all the ways that God would lead us through this blessed promised land, but we'll follow until we die. We don't understand. There's sometimes we're going to suffer because we're believers while sinners prosper. But listen to me, I got good news. It ain't gonna always be like that. Because at the end of history, when it's all done, all of the nation's wealth will be brought into the kingdom. And the Bible says that the meek, not the proud, not the arrogant, not the gatherers and the holders who think that's all there is to life, in the end, the meek will inherit the earth. And his people, God's people, will receive what sinners gathered. And in the meantime, what we have now is reward of work. Now listen to me this morning as I can get to ready to get to my seat. God's given every one of us a work to do. And we do this work knowing why. Why do we do this work? We do this work because we know that Jesus has already done the greater work in redeeming us unto himself. And he's still working today. We know that. He's still working in his church. We share in the good work by giving people the gospel. I want to ask, are you, are you sharing in the good work? Are you opening your mouth and telling people about Jesus? We, 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 we share in the good work is when we get up and sing on Sundays. We sing together as a church. We love our neighbor. We pray. We, we come and we, we give of the, uh, of the bounty that God has blessed us with financially. And then we also do it by just living the ordinary task of life. Martin Luther put it this way. I like this. The entire world should be, a, should be a full of service to God. Not only the churches, but also the home, the kitchen, the workshop, and the field. Amen. So that's where we are. Are you finding God's strength? 
Are you finding God's strength in the work you do? And whatever you do in life, listen, whatever you do in life, are you busy? Whether you're a housewife, a worker, whatever you do, are you busy about the work of King Jesus? Because each of us work in different ways. But it's all at the same work to the glory of God. And I close this morning's message with a quote from 1 Corinthians 15 58. Community Baptist, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing. That in the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. So whether it's through the church, through your work, loving your neighbor, praying, giving, doing it in your home, your work is not in vain. Are you working for the Lord? S-O-N. Father, thank you for the word of God this morning. And uh, Lord, thank you for the truth of your word today. That you have spoken clearly to us in your word. Thank you, Father, that there is joy and pleasure in the work we do because our toil is not just for this world but is a gift from you so help us to see that way and forgive us Lord hey we're saved the many of us in here are saved some of us are not saved we pray you draw them but for those that are saved Lord forgive us because times we look at life under the S-U-N not the S-O-N and so Lord, help us to live that out to your glory in Jesus name Thank you.